Brightness, I think, is the way to go in, in mm -hmm. music, in art. Yep. And uh, so your very first single, Rendezvous, and I was listening to it. I got in the car yesterday to go home, and I put Dash Radio's Discover on. And as luck would have it, Rendezvous was playing. Oh, and timing. I was listening to it, and I was like, you know, I cannot. First of all, I don't even like to use the, the term genre-defying, because I think that in itself is trite. But you are doing that. Thank you. And you're also sort of not emulating anybody. Thank you. I, I hope so. Yeah. I feel like what I tried to do was take a bunch of things that I love musically from years past and current and just kind of fuse it into one. And it sort of became its own lane. Yeah. And I do feel like it is a little bit genre defying when I try and explain it to people. Yeah. I don't even really know where to start. I'm like, it's kind of a mix of a lot of different things because one of the things you find in show business and especially here in los angeles is people want to go okay how do we put this girl in a box mm -hmm. how do we go okay when we need that we go get her mm -hmm. and i know something about that so having lived here for 20 years mm -hmm. so and you grew up here right i actually grew up on the east coast but my mom is from here so i've okay. spent a lot of time in la so you spent a lot years. of time so you kind of get that people oh, are yeah. be like how would you define yourself you probably hate that, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Because you're, the same way when you would ask anybody that outside of art, no one really has one clear answer. Exactly. And so why should art have to have one? Right. Right. So uh, you're, the, 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 the song is getting a lot of attention. You, you've got an EP coming, right? Mm -hmm. Now that, if I'm not mistaken, that's called Moonchild? Is that that's what it is? correct. Tell me about that title and what does that say about you? Because I, I understand you have a, a great affinity for the moon. I do. Um, essentially, well, for my uh, spiritual zodiac people, they will know that I am a cancer sign, so that's our planet is ruled by the moon. So I've always loved the moon. I've had this fascination with it forever. And then... I, during the pandemic, when we were in the middle of writing the EP, discovered an old journal of mine from a few years past, and there was a poem in there that felt like it still really resonated with how I was feeling now, and that I could turn it into something that could be part of this project, and the poem was called Moonchild, and it was just all about, it's, it doesn't even say that much, but in not saying much, it says a lot, and it became the intro track of the EP, and so then the namesake of the EP, and it felt like a perfect way to describe me and set it on the path of what to expect going forward. Interesting. Now, again, without giving it away yet, because we'll get there, but um, you grew up in show business. Correct. So what impact, I mean, I'm sure, obviously here you are. <laughs> so uh, did you ever think about doing anything else? Did you go to college and study anything and say, eh, no, I want to sing and hundred percent. I actually always wanted to do music since I was a kid and music and acting and just anything in the arts, I was always in love with it. And I grew up my mom and my mom's whole side, which was the side that was, had been in the arts, um, was obviously very supportive of that and saw, you know, they've seen it real time. So it wasn't as scary. And my dad just grew up in Long Island. He's a lawyer, a little bit more of a logical thinker. So it's good to have in the family. It is good. When I you're have, in show business, yes, that's a good thing. Yes, it was a great balance. But the the deal that we struck was that I um, if I went to college and graduated and had a nice you know plan B a degree to fall back on that they would support whatever it was I I wanted to do so I'm really thankful that they made me do that because I feel yeah. like that's really the time where you start to grow up and if I had gone any younger I I just wouldn't have been ready so. I did. I worked an office job nine to five in Chicago out of college and absolutely hated my life. I didn't even make it a year. I was like, this is this was a fun experiment yeah, that we've yeah. tried to do here. But I think I know what's really going on here, which is that I'm destined to make it back into the arts. You talked about the pandemic and when it hit and the effect that it kind of had on you as like an artist, a songwriter. And I understand like, you know, you you, you were spending some alone time mm -hmm. during that time. The troubled times really do seem to like kind of bring out the best in artists. Don't you agree? 100%. And I even think, I mean, this this past week has been a huge one for music. And like Harry Styles' album just came out. Kendrick Lamar's album just came out. And both are albums that I feel like are just representative of how tragedy and self 
uh, discovery can just inspire art so much because you finally feel like you have something more to say mm -hmm. and you've had time to reflect. Whereas when things are good, it's when things are good and they feel like they're coasting along, it's great. And obviously that's what we strive for, for things to feel good uh, and to continue to feel good. But a lot of times they that means that it lacks any sort of tri like trials and tribulations that would cause inspiration or yeah. time to think and, and write and feel like there is something more to say. So I think so, definitely. They, they say that you, you can't really force the muses, but can you? Can you, as a songwriter, if I said, hey, I'm going to go down the street and get some pizza over here and I'll come back and please write a song while I'm gone, could you... You could do it. I you mean, it might not it. be the song. Totally. That's, that's the difference. I think it's that you could do it. And there are so many songwriters who their job is as a songwriter writing for other artists that they're not necessarily always writing from personal experience. So right. a lot of it is trying to find something in those moments that feels like it might be relatable or that you could come up with in a certain amount of time. It can totally happen. And I've written those songs, but definitely the ones that come way more naturally, way more gen genuinely and in an authentic way from usually where you least expect it, mm -hmm. bear the, the best songs. I've spent some time around songwriters. I've got a family member that's written songs. And, and um, so I understand about sometimes it's like you get three people in the room and you all sit down and you start talking about how everything's going with you. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden someone in the room, it doesn't matter which of the three it is, um, will say something that sparks a thing. Yep. Has that happened for you a lot? Definitely. I mean, I am n typically when I write for my project with my collaborators, it's based centered around me and what's happening in my life or something that I've thought of a concept that's come to me or something that's inspired me to say something. But it could be anybody in the room who comes up with a cool guitar part or a cool melody or here's what we want to say and this or this could be a really cool line or this could be a really cool title and whatever feels right in the moment even if i'm not the one to say it we'll we'll run with i don't ever feel like it has to be me making an every single decision because the best art is done collaboratively especially today and in music so uh, yeah it's some usually it's something very random you'll say like one word and then one of my co-writers would be like, yes, yeah, right. that's it. There the moon, go. whatever it is, you know, that sticks. Let's talk about, because um, there's a sensuality in Rendezvous, and I get the feeling that's going to infuse itself in a lot of your work. Yeah. Um, in my generation, I'm old school, so pardon me. Uh, I'll sometimes think, say things that are boomer-like. <laughs> but um, in my generation, we say there's nothing sexier than a woman who doesn't have to try to be sexy. Mm -hmm. It just kind of, you are. Um, is that something, because I feel like with you, it kind of being ex expressive in that way and being, for lack of a better or a less crude word, being sexy, um, how, do you, how do you look at it and its place in your art? And then how do you look at it when you see someone that's, overtly being sexualized like Britney Spears being right. the classic example of that and how do you feel about that and people trying to make you do that I think that I, I completely agree that I think that some of the sexiest ways to be sexy is by not trying and it's very I don't know it's very antiquated because there's there's so much power, especially now, for young women to embrace their idea of sensuality, sexuality, however they want to feel about it, and to own that in a way that feels to them like it's honoring something really genuine that they feel makes them feel powerful and sexy. Whereas I feel like traditionally, and in even you know a, a decade or two ago, um, it was way more about you know, you look at what's on the magazines and what's in t what's in TV and movies, and it was about girls looking a certain way, young women looking a certain way, acting a certain way to appeal to other people. Where now it's much more personalized. It's like, what would it, how would it feel to me? Would it make me feel sexy? Because then, if that's how you embody it, if that's the attitude that you give off, it's inherently sexier than if you're trying to do it to achieve something else, to achieve it for someone else to think that you're sexy. 
And another thing that, that I see that's pretty clear in what you're doing is uh, a sense of fashion and then also sort of an eye on retro styling. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that, uh, those are conscious choices that you're making. Um, does that come from the influence of your iconic family member? A great amount of it, yes. I think because of the era that, that she grew up in and, um, and the music and the styling around that time in cinema, in, in fashion, is so, to me, legendary. And it's cool how everything, you know, everything old is new again. It's sort of coming back in style yeah. now as well. But I think that it matches the sound and the, and the energy of the music. And it just so happens that I love that style and it comes from the era that she existed in and thrived in. And I think it's a cool tie in to kind of pay homage and also bring it current. Yeah. And then it's also now, you know, it's not like I stick out like a sore thumb dressing no. the way that I do. It's, yeah. it's cool now. It's fashionable. And I love, you know, keeping up with trends. And I've always been in love with fashion and, and styling. So it's, it's cool how it's all come together. So now let's talk about your grandmother. Uh, so I think this is a good, we've talked about sexuality and fashion. I think it's a good sort yeah. of pivot now to talk about the legendary Eartha Kitt. Mm -hmm. um, you grew up with her as your very first inspiration. Mm -hmm. What is a favorite memory that you have? Wow. There's a... So, it's sort of hard to pick one, it's sorry. So, it's hard to pick one. Right. There's one, I, I, I might have shared this in, at some point, but I, uh, I must have been like seven or eight years old, and we were living when when my family moved to Connecticut. My my grandma also moved to Connecticut, and she lived five minutes away, so she would come over all the time. And there was one day where my grandma she was doing, God, she must have been doing a touring show of something, maybe Cinderella, and she could not figure out how to do harmonies. And I have this innate. Thing with harmonies I can just hear them and, and pick them out and she scheduled an appointment with me like I'm oh seven years old she scheduled an appointment with me for my mom to bring me over to her house to essentially try and teach her how to do harmonies and we we, we picked the song for good from wicked and we tried for hours and she could do it when it was isolated but she could never do it when I was trying to do it with her and she oh was goodness. getting so frustrated she was like you know what it's not it's not for me Wow yeah so we, we know so much about Eartha Kitt. Um, she was a true Renaissance woman mm -hmm. and could do a, a lot of things very well. Yep. Um, Tonys, Emmys, um, Orson Welles once called her, I think, is the most exciting woman in the world. Yep. She was a very bold, fearless, dynamic person. Very. Much like yourself. Thank you. And so what is something about her that we don't know, that you, that you know personally, that you feel like people should know about her? I mean, so much about her persona was this like sex icon, bold, brash uh, figure. And really she was very quiet and loved keeping to herself. Nobody spent, I, you know, all she spent her money on was plants and composting. And she lived a very quiet, wholesome life in, mm. in the end. and. The, like, I mean, I was going to say Eartha, but I call her Nana. But the Nana that, like, I saw was, you know, she would come and sit at my birthday parties and watch us and and hang out. And she would come over every day and loved, like, family time. She was very traditional. She loved family time and she loved spending time by herself. And she kept a very, very eclectic home, but because she loved being home all the time. She did not really like... She loved performing, but she was very much a homebody, as I am, as my mom is. And yeah, I think most people probably see her as this grandiose personality. And right. She really was very calm and very to herself. A lot of artists are like that. And it's like there's there's like two sides of a coin. Mm -hmm. You know, there there's in, introverted extroverts or however, however the phrase goes. <laughs> and I, I, I myself, just as a quick aside, I'm I've done stand up comedy. I've done theater. I've been doing radio my whole life. I've done television, movies and but you get me away from this and I'm the shyest person in the world. Mm -hmm. So I completely understand that. And I think that's a beautiful humanization of someone that we just have this iconic view of from 50,000 feet, Yeah. you know? Yeah. So um, do you have a release date yet for the, uh, 
for the EP? Is it EP or album? EP. Okay, It's cool. going to be a four-song EP. Uh, I don't have an exact release date, but I'm looking at the last week of August. So Very cool. whenever we decide that, I'll be, I'm sure, blasting it on social media and, and stuff like that. But we'll do a big release show with it, probably in L.A., maybe one in New York as well. And then... See how the rollout goes. Give everybody your socials so they know how to get in touch. Yeah, so uh, you can find me on Instagram. Pretty much on uh, everything social, it's at Nora May Official. So on Instagram, on TikTok, on Twitter, although I'm the worst tweeter ever because I always forget I have Twitter. And uh, on Facebook, it's Nora May Official across the board. Someone else had Nora May on Instagram. So oh, I no. I, uh, <laughs> the very best of luck to you. Thank you. And... Um, Come back anytime. Thank You're welcome you. Welcome here, at Dash. Yeah. You ever want to do a showcase here? We got a stage out there. Uh, so. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. I saw it with my face on it. It was very cool. Thank you. Thank you.